Right, this is 7.2.3. This is gravitational potential. In this lesson, we're going to introduce a new quantity called potential. And we're going to see what, exactly what that means. So first, let's look at the gravitational field strength again. We'll look at the gravitational field lines. We mentioned this in the previous lessons about the difference between radial fields and the difference between a uniform field. So near the surface of the Earth, near the surface, we have a uniform field because the surface looks flat. And so the field lines look like they're parallel. So near the surface, our gravitational field strength is equal to 9.8 on Earth, newtons per kilogram. But on a larger scale, we get uh, a radial field. So I'm going to draw the mass as a point mass. And we have radial field lines. Now what happens if I go around in a circle around this mass? Any different point. If I go around in a circle, what happens? Well, you'll notice that the, the distance between the field lines will not change if I'm only moving around in a circle. So if I were to move around in a circle like this, where I'm not getting closer and I'm not getting any further away, the field lines don't change. The density of the field lines don't change. So this one is called a uniform field. It's not a true uniform field, rather it's an approximation. And this one is a non-uniform field. We call it a radial field. Where G is proportional to 1 over R squared. Yes. The overall gravitational field will if the second mass is comparable in any way to the first mass. So if, it, if it's the Earth and the Moon? If it's the Earth and the Moon, there will be a region where, where the field actually behaves differently. But if we make the mass very, very small compared to the Earth, like a human, a car, a rocket, then the distortion in that field is negligible. Let's show how um, near the surface of the Earth the gravitational field strength is uniform. Let's show it mathematically. So let's draw the Earth and we draw it with a radius R and we say that we go up to some height H. Maybe you've climbed a mountain, or you've gone up a hill, or you've gone into the shard and you've gone to the top floor. Yeah? So you've gone up by some height. Does anyone know the height of the shard, by the way? How much? Are you sure? Or are you just guessing? Well, 90 meters is quite high, though, anyway, isn't it? Right. Well, it's still quite high, whether you're right or wrong. 90 meters is quite high. So, what I'm going to ask you though, oh, does, what is it? <laughs> Alright, 310. So, Shard is 310 meters high, we get all the way to the top. It's quite high, yeah? If you've been to the Shard, or you've ever looked at the Shard, it's very high. Does that compare to the radius of the Earth though? No, it doesn't. So, now let's show you how that works mathematically. 
So the force that you will feel if you are at this point up here, which is R plus H, is going to be mg, and that's given by g m1 m2, and we say that you are m2, all over the separation squared, and the separation is the radius of the planet plus the extra height that you've gone up by. So it's r plus h all squared. You notice that here, m2 again cancels on both sides. So we get back to g again. And if the height is much, much less than r, that implies that r plus h is approximately equal to r. Well, let's try that out. 6,400 times 10 to the 3 plus 320. It's still 6,400 times 10 to the 3, is it not? So if h is very, very small compared to r, then when you add them together, you still approximately still have r. It doesn't make a difference. It's negligible. So if it's negligible, then g gm1 over r plus h squared is roughly equal to gm1 over r squared, because r plus h is roughly equal to r. So if you did that, then g is equal to 9.81 newtons per kilogram until h is big. And it has to be big compared to the radius of the Earth. So how do we know when h is big? When they are comparable. So get your calculator, put 6,400 times 10 to the 3 plus the height of the shard, which is about 300, and, was it 320 meters? 310. Put 300. Yeah. Equals. What do you get? Uh, you still get 6,400 times 10 to the 3. Always 10. Right? Yeah, more or less, yeah. Right? If you, gave it, if you gave your answer two significant figures, nothing's changed. If you gave your answer to three significant figures, nothing's changed. If you gave your answer to four significant figures, nothing's changed. Yeah. Yes? So... That means that H was much, much less than R, so adding it onto R made no difference. So if you did the calculation, you get basically the same number. Even if you included it in there, you'll get the same number. Yeah? All right. So now let's look at um, energy changes in lifting a mass or weight. So we start from the surface of the Earth. So here's our mass uh, M. If we were to lift it up by some height, we call that delta H, we know that the force is equal to mg. And we know that the work done in lifting this up is equal to force times by the parallel displacement. So we're to work out the work done, we sub the 2 in, which is mgs. But s is just a change in height. So s equals to delta h. So if we were to sub that in, we get mg delta h. What is mg delta h? You've seen this before. Good. So it's the change in gravitational potential energy. So this is delta E P. So I'm going to bring to you a new quantity. 
And this new quantity is called gravitational potential. Notice I'm not using the word energy. It's not gravitational potential energy. I'm going to introduce something different that's called gravitational potential. And the gravitational potential is defined, and we will write down the definition later on, but it's defined as the work done to bring a mass to a specific point in a gravitational field from a place of zero potential. A place of zero potential basically means a place where that field is zero. So where is the field zero? Infinitely far away. So in other words, the gravitational potential is the work done per unit mass to bring that mass to that specific point in the field from a place of zero potential, which is at infinity. So infinitely far away, how much work do you need to do to bring it here? Infinite. Or vice versa, is how much work do you need to do to take it away? Infinite. No, it's not infinite. No. It's not infinite. No, it's not. It's not. So let's start on a new page. We're going to look at this as the rubber sheet model. Yeah, we'll start a new page. So the rubber sheet model is actually very good at showing us um, what gravitational potentials look like. And actually, you're going to see that it resembles the potential well, like an electron's energy well, right? However, the electron's energy well was discrete. It was like a square-shaped well. Either you have enough energy to escape the entire depth, or you don't. Whereas with a gravitational potential well, it's going to be a smooth well. And it actually also looks like um, the relativistic model of gravity that deforms space-time. So the rubber sheet model, it's like you take a flat rubber sheet, you place a heavy object onto it, and it deforms a rubber sheet by making an energy well. So let's draw our energy well. So here's the Earth, mass m. So this is the energy well of Earth. So at this point, where you're at the, at the Earth itself, you have a value of minus 64 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram. At another point, which is further up, you could have another value like minus 30 times 10 to the 6 joules per kilogram. These values are random. The Earth's one is actually, you can work it out, but the others are going to be random. And then, if you were to get all the way to the top of this energy well, where this, where it becomes flat again, and at that point, there is no potential. So over there, you've got zero joules per kilogram. And that is at infinity. Now, there's a, actually another unit of measurement for joules per kilogram, or the gravitational potential. Can you guess what that unit is? It's a volt. Gravitational voltage. It does, because they're both fields. So joule per kilogram is also a volt. So every planet makes a gravitational field. And every planet in the field <coughs> has a gravitational potential V. All the potentials you notice are negative so far. Why would that be negative? Because 
So let's, let's go back to the definition. The gravitational potential is the work done per unit mass to bring it to that point in the field from a place of zero potential. How much work needs to be done to bring that mass there? Why is it negative? Well, yeah, it is negative work. What does that mean? No, it's not that it's already there. The work needs to be done to move it. Huh? No. The mass work, work needs to be done. It means, it means that it is not doing work itself. Work is being done on it. If you want to approach the Earth, you do not need to do work. The Earth will pull you itself. The Earth is doing the work for you. So, again, we go back to also similar concepts from thermal about who's doing the work and who the work is being done on. Is it doing work or is work being done on it? So in this case, who's doing the work? Work is being done on it. If we reverse the situation, if you want to escape the Earth's gravitational field, you have to do the work. And in that case, it will be positive. That's how much work you have done. So if you are doing negative work, it means that you're gaining that instead. So if I drop something, it's gaining energy. It's not losing energy. If I want to escape, though, I have to lose energy. Yes, exactly. So, does the electron need to do work to become bound into that atom? The photon gives it energy. Exactly. So, the electron doesn't need to do work to join the atom. The atom will pull it anyway. But if the electron wants to escape the atom, it needs to do work. And it does work by gaining that energy from a photon. The same thing, except for this energy well is not discrete. It's not square. So, it's not you either have enough or you don't. It's you can move in and out of this field. It's not in steps. In quantum, everything is in steps. There is no like halfway in between. It's either you have enough or you don't have enough. Yes. So let's capture this. All potentials are negative. Because work is done by the planet. And that means that the mass is gaining energy. And you'll, you'll experience this when you walk up and down the stairs. When you walk down the stairs, it's very easy. If the stairs disappeared, you'll just drop down anyway without doing any work. But if you're going up the stairs, you have to do work and you get tired. Yeah. You know, uh, going back to Heist, this model here uh, and the zero, it's, it's a zero G was equilibrium and the very, uh, when, the, when, the, when, the, when we go out of force, when we go out the gravitational field, mm -hmm. it's if the gravitational field is infinite, how can there be zero work done? Who said anything about zero work done? It says it all okay, done. if you want to be at that point, how much work do you need to do at infinity to stay at infinity? Zero. That energy will, you choose a point on that field. I've given you three different points. Okay. So, I've given you a point that's infinitely far away, so you're not even in the potential well anymore. You're outside of it. If you're outside of the potential well and you want to remain outside of the potential well, how much work do you or something else need to do to stay there? No work. None. If you want to be halfway in that potential well, how much work needs to be done? 30 times 10 to the power of 6 joules per kilogram. So if you had 10 kilograms, you multiply that by 10. Okay. If you had 5 kilograms, you multiply that by 5. If you had 1 kilogram, it would be 30 times 10 to the 6. Okay. Now, is the mass going to do the work to get there? Yes. No, it's not. The mass is not going to do the work to get there. The planet is going to do the work on it. You do not lose energy when you fall into a planet. Okay. The planet is doing the work for you. Okay. 
right? Yeah. If, if you want to land, you don't need to burn fuel to land on the earth. Because Earth pulls you down anyway. If I pick up a pencil and drop it, the pencil doesn't need to do any work to reach the Earth. The Earth does work on it. it gains, the pencil gains energy from the Earth. Now, if we want to move from one place to another place, we need to look at what is the potential here, what is the potential in the next place. We find the difference between them. If you find the difference between two potentials, you found a what? A potential difference. Ah, voltage, potential difference. And then if you know what the potential difference is, the work done is just the mass multiplied by that potential difference. So to work done, to move between two places, is the mass times by the potential difference. Put a box around that, that's an equation you need to know. And we'll write it down here that delta V is the gravitational potential difference between two places. This is the work done in moving between one place to another place. Right, let's turn it onto a new page. So now we, we know we have a concept of a potential difference and that we need a potential difference to know how much work is done or needing to be done to move from point A to point B in a gravitational field. But we don't yet know how to work out these potentials. So now we're going to look at how we work them out and we're going to capture that definition that I mentioned earlier. So we make a new title here, Potential and Equipotentials. And first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define the gravitational potential again. So gravitational potential. is a work done bringing a unit mass to that point in the field from a place of zero potential. And zero potential is called infinity, where we're infinitely far away. Put a box around this definition, as it's one that you're going to need to recall in exams.
Now I want to draw a gravitational field. So we're going to draw a radial field. And we'll try to draw it sufficiently large. And on purpose, I'm going to put the arrowheads a bit further out than I usually do. Just because I need space closer in to write other stuff. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a few circles around this mass. Did come out a little bit wonky, but they are circles, supposed to be circles. And I'm just going to make a little space inside each of these circles so I can just write a label. So I'll put here minus 50, minus 40, minus 30. So these numbers represent the gravitational potential at each of those circles. And these are measured in mega joules per kilogram. So they're all actually times 10 to the 6. So it's minus 50 times 10 to the 6, minus 40 times 10 to the 6. Each of these circles I've drawn are called equipotentials. So these are gravitational equipotentials. Comes from the word equal and potential. Because You'll notice if I go around each of those circles, I'm neither getting closer to that mass, nor am I getting further away from it, nor is the distance between the field lines getting denser or less dense. So we're not actually using any energy going around in those circles, those equipotentials. So that explains the fact that how long the moon has been orbiting around our Earth and how long the Earth has been orbiting around the sun. And they don't run out of energy and just fall in. So the question is, why do they keep going on forever? Why do they not like just get tired one day and just fall into the sun or the moon gets tired and fall into the earth? Well, because work is not being done. If you're going around something in an equipotential, you're going around in a circle, you're neither getting closer nor further away, work is not being done. So here I want to make a few uh, different locations. So over here, I'm going to put location A. And over here, I'm going to put location B. Then I'm going to put location X over here. And put location Y over here. And put location Z over here. So we've got location A to B. And then we've put, got location X, Y, and Z also. So the idea is that going from A to B is the same amount of work, no matter what path is taken. Going from A to B is the same amount of work. regardless of path taken. So let's elaborate on that. So work done for A to B directly and work done For A to X to Y to Z to B is the same. So we don't care if you've gone around the equipotentials or you've gone that path and that path. We care about the starting position and the ending position. No matter what path you took to get there, the work done is the same. 
So if we think of an orbit, say we're orbiting on equipotential A. We'll keep going around that equipotential. Every time we do one rotation, we've come back to where we were. So what's the potential difference? Zero. Even going around the equipotential, we've still got a potential difference of zero. So work done in an orbit is zero. And it's why planets don't get tired and fall into their stars. And the potential difference in an orbit is also zero. And that, again, can be evaluated using work done equals to m delta v. No, the that's not what it's saying. It's saying if you go from A to B, yeah. the work done for that is the same as the work done if you went A to X to Y to Z to B. Oh, okay. The start and the end is the only important thing. Okay. Yeah? The work done from A to X is actually zero. The work done from X to Y is going to be the potential difference between X and Y. So it's minus 50 and minus 40. What's the potential difference there? Uh, it's not minus, it's plus 10. Only plus 10. To go from minus 50 to minus 40, you have to plus 10. So you have to do work. Yeah. So it's, that's plus 10 megajoules per kilogram. So moving from X to Y, work has to be done. Moving from Y to Z, work it has to be done. But if you go from A to B directly, or you go A to X to Y to Z to B, the work done is the same. Yeah? So you know, um, you know how we went from A to B, right? B was yeah. anywhere in that orbit radius. So, so yeah, so look, B was a point. But it could be anywhere on that thing. But anywhere you are on that equipotential, the work done is the same. So yeah. A to Z is the same work done as A to B. Yeah. Because let's think about it. How can we get from A to B? We can go directly in one go. So then we have a potential difference of plus 20 megajoules per kilogram. And then once we're at B, we can just slide along that equipotential until we get to Z. Yeah. So the work done is still plus 20 megajoules per kilogram. Right, finally, I'm going to give you an equation to work out the potentials at any point. So up to this point, you're appreciating that these potentials exist. Now you're going to be able to work them out. So the gravitational potential V is equal to minus GM over R. Notice how all these equations look the same. And it's negative because you're not going to do the work. Work will be done on you. Same page. Right, let's move on to a new page, and now we're going to look at how G and V are related. So first, I'm going to write down the equations. G equals to G M over R squared. And V equals to minus GM over R. The relationship between these two is that G 
is the gradient of V with respect to R. So G is equal to DV dr, which means it's the gradient of a V graph. Put a box around that. Because G and M are constants, R can change, depends on where we want to be located. So if we work out DV dr, we've got minus so let's take everything else as constant, remove them. V is proportional to minus r to the power of minus 1, because 1 over r is r to the power of minus 1. If we differentiate that, we bring the minus 1 down, and we multiply it to the minus that was already there. It becomes a plus. So the minus has disappeared when you take the gradient. And then the minus 1 power becomes a minus 2. And a minus 2 power means 1 over r squared. So now you've got g is proportional to 1 over r squared. No, because if you look at the first equation, v equals to g minus gm over r, that's also equal to, and I'll write this down and then wipe it back off again. So v is equal to minus gm r to the minus 1. If we were to differentiate this, we do dv dr equals to d by dr of minus gm r to the minus 1. Okay, well, minus gm, they're constants, aren't they? We don't care about those constants. So let's take them outside. Because d by dr is not going to affect them. So I'm just going to multiply them back on the outside. Minus gm. Yeah? So now, if I work out d by dr of r to the minus 1, that's going to become, the minus 1 will come down here, and then we take away 1 from the power. Yeah? So that becomes minus r to the minus 2, and we multiply that back to it, minus gm. Minus and minus cancel, so that's equal to gm r to the minus 2, which is equal to gm minus power means 1 over, so r squared. Yeah? All right, I'm going to wipe all of that off now. So let's see what that looks like on a graph. Wrong color. So if we put R on the x-axis, on the vertical positive y-axis, I'm going to put G. And on the vertical negative axis, I'm going to put V. If we were to draw a V graph, it's minus 1 over R graph. So that's going to be asymptotic. And if we drew a, uh, a G graph, it's a 1 over R squared graph, which looks like a 1 over R graph. However, it falls much quicker. So again, it's going to be asymptotic, but it's going to fall much quicker than V. So for G, it's going to look similar, but it's going to fall much quicker. So this line is proportional to minus 1 over R, and this line is proportional to 1 over R squared. So this one is much steeper. So the reverse is also true. If you can differentiate V to get to G, you can integrate or find the area underneath G to get V. 
So V equals to the integral of G dr which means that V is area under G. Put a box around that. And that is the end of 7.2.3.